Hello. Uh, I've been doing applied statistics for a long time. Uh, one of the challenges that I've set for myself over my career is to try and figure out what's real and what's not. And we're looking at a system that many people think is, uh, is failing. It's a crisis. Uh, I like to portray it in the following way. If you're looking at some waves and you want to get to here, but you want to go in a smooth path where you make just small changes. So you can make small changes along here. You can go behind the wave, and then all of a sudden you find yourself on the top of the wave and you crash through. So we've gotten to a place where we've made small changes in how we do science, and now I'm going to make the argument that we're in a crisis, uh, things are failing. Uh, you've seen this slide. Uh, I'll add one thing. Many scientists are personally impacted by bad science. They try and do another experiment and it fails. And then they go back and they say, why was I going in that direction? So a survey of real scientists who are impacted by this uh, is, is quite worthwhile. Here, what doesn't fit? My car works. My cell phone works. The water comes out of the tap. All of those things work. They're all industrial. They're all depending on specific scientific and engineering principles. <laughs> All the papers that come out of here, 70, 80% of them don't work. This works. We all have them in our pockets. These are fantastically powerful instruments. They're incredibly complicated, and they work. Here are two papers that came out in the 90s on uh, this environmental epidemiology, does air pollution cause deaths. Both papers were funded by the EPA. This paper came out, New England Journal of Medicine, 1993. This journal came out in Environmental Health Perspectives, another highly rated journal. This was positive, this was negative. And they both came out at about the same time. <coughs> I would argue that there was a political decision by the EPA to fund people like this. I know these people, they were cut off with funding. What to do? What to do depends on the circumstances. You have workers, these are researchers, you have editors. You have funders, and mostly here we are consumers of other people's work. Deming, a very famous industrial statistician, said, if the system is not working, do not depend on the workers to change it. The workers are very happy with what's going on. They're very happy with the status quo. So preaching to workers has not worked and is not expected to work. Editors, they control a lot of the system. The real control is with funders. So if we want to change the system, we have to get the funders and the editors to change the system. We are going to be enormously wasting our time if we preach to the workers. The workers are happy living within the system that they're in, and if they fail in that system, they go off and do something else. But the people that live in the universities are very happy with what's going on. Scientific incentives. There's been some discussion of that. You need a p-value less than 0.05. Positive results are funded. Negative results stop funding. So I would not publish a negative result. 
because I will not get any more money. Confirmation bias, it's technically easy to get a p-value, everyone knows that. You manipulate the data, you ask a lot of questions, you compute multiple models, and you just churn through that. And we'll see how much you can do it. This is usually not talked about. Skin in the game. If I am in industry, I sell a product. I don't sell a paper, I sell a product. If my product doesn't work, I fail. Industry fails. On the other hand, if I'm in a university, my product is a paper. In the military parlance, it's fire and forget. Put the paper into the literature and move on to something else. There is no, essentially no penalty for failing. Your claim doesn't work, who cares? Uh, this is a little intricate, so I'll read it to you. I was looking in environmental health perspectives, a very prominent uh, environmental epidemiology journal, and I simply took eight papers that appeared in that journal, and I very meticulously went through each paper, and I counted the number of outcomes they were looking at, the number of predictors they were using to make those outcomes, the number of lags, this was a time thing, so things can happen today and affect something tomorrow. The number of covariates, age, gender, so forth and so on. You should be sort of seeing here, the number of questions is the first four. And you can see in these eight papers, they went from, 50, from three all the way up to 560. Now, covariates can either be in the model or not. So a very simple approximation is to say two, the, two to the number of covariates. That's this column. Now, if you multiply questions times models, the numbers go all the way from 384 up to uh, roughly 180,000. So this is the raw material that a modeler or person writing a paper has. And so when we talk about p-hacking, we need to know the scope of the possibility. The scope is enormous. Now, if people have said, oh, Stan, no one can test 180,000 models. We did it. We did a sensitivity study. We went on the web and we used, uh, you know, Amazon whatever, and we ran 170,000 models in an afternoon. You don't even have to be that brute forceage. All you have to do is keep trying this and trying that, and you get a lead, you fix that, and then you try the next thing. So sequential searching can very rapidly go through these large search spaces. There's another point. If you don't get the answer you want, a positive that will get you funding, you simply put it in the file drawer. It's gone. It's in the memory hole. This is great. Are there any uh, insect people around? One of these is a monarch and one is a viceroy. They're two separate butterflies. I can't tell the difference between them, and neither can a bird. So the bird will not eat the viceroy because it thinks it might get a monarch. Now think about writing a scientific paper. In writing a scientific paper, you're constructing a story, and you want your story to appear as correct and wonderful as possible. You're an expert. All the people in this room, they're experts. You can write a good story. You wouldn't be here if you couldn't write a good story. Now think of the consumer. The consumer has to tell the difference between a good story and a bad story. Is it any wonder that we're in a bucket of soup? A little simulation. Just a little randomness here. We're random <coughs> things. What I did is I used random numbers, and I have <coughs> 20 tumor types, 
and I have five different nations, United States, England, whatever. And I've helped you out a little bit. These are the p-values that are smaller than 0.05. All right, now if I am a disreputable science person, what I would do is I would write a paper and I would say tumor number five is very prevalent in company, country number three. That's my first paper. My second paper is tumor number 12 is very prevalent in country number one. So I've got two papers now, and I've got two, uh, yeah, total one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four papers that I can write. Now, I do not put in any of these papers the full table, okay? Because negative results are not important. Now we come to a trick. What is a p-value plot? P-values under the null hypothesis are supposed to be uniformly distributed over the interval zero to one, nice and even. So what we do is we rank order the p-values from smallest to largest. All right, now. And then we plot them against the integers, one, two, three, four, up to 100 in this case. If those p-values fall on a 45-degree line, we're observing the null situation. Here's the data. Here are all the p-values. Here's a p-value plot, pretty close to a 45-degree line. And we notice that there are a few p-values down here below 0.05. Well, those are the nuggets that we use to write papers, OK? And we do not show all the rest of this. That would be fatal to our good story enterprise. It's a subtle trick here. Suppose we've done that. But behind every number here, there is an effect, the, the magnitude of the effect. So let's assume that we really have the null situation we've simulated, and now let's look at the effect. If you have 100, if you have 400 situations that you look at, you expect a, a t-test of about three. So behind the null p-values that we looked at, there is a number, and that number is going to be crucially important in the next step of what we're going to do. We're going to look at a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis takes a number from each paper and puts it into a procedure to see how the whole effect is going on. Well, now think backwards. If we're looking at null distributions, and we pick the smallest p-value out of 100, the number coming across to the meta-analysis is going to be 3. Yikes. Keep thinking. So what is a meta-analysis? We pick a claim or a question. We do a computer search of the literature. We select papers based on the question. And then we combine the individual results. We combine the individual results. This is a biased number. The main point of a meta-analysis is the number coming into the meta-analysis has to be an unbiased estimator of the question at issue. So if some of the studies are null studies, but they've looked at a lot of things, we have biased numbers coming in. I hate to be crude. Garbage in, garbage out. These meta-analyses are essentially cookbook now. You have computers to do the search of the literature. You pull off the numbers. You drop them into another program. You get your meta-analysis. A skilled team in China, for example, can produce one meta-analysis per week. They don't care 
about the question. They care about getting the publication. The government of China will pay them per publication. Uh, there are about 5,000 meta-analysis studies that appear every year. Okay, we've talked about p-value plots, and here are 10 examples of p-value plots where the number of p-values is 20. This is a null study. The next thing is an absolute shocker. What did I get when I looked at a meta-analysis? I got this. Okay. These are small p-values indicating there is a real effect. These are null p-values indicating there's no effect. So I'm watching and just completely blown away. Both of these answers cannot be correct. There's either something going on or there's nothing going on. I'm looking at air pollution, JAMA study, heterogeneity, ozone, NO2, PM2.5. What do you see? You see these bilinear forms. So are all of these air components dangerous, causing heart attacks? Or are all of these things null, not causing heart attacks? Uh, this is asthma, same thing. Lots of p-values that are really small, lots of p-values that are falling on this no-effect no line. Uh, I'll back up. I think it's a matter of judgment, but I think the small p-values are coming from manipulating p-hacking and manipulating covariates. I've told you that there are thousands to hundreds of thousands of possibilities for people to do that. And we have to reach a judgment as to whether these are p-hacks and these are bad studies, or these are the truth and these are p-hacks. Okay, the manager of the system. What can the manager do, the editor? They can require public access to data. That will put the fear of God into these researchers. They ought to put into the title of every paper whether they consider that an exploratory paper or a confirmatory paper. They ought to warn the reader so that we don't have this monarch, viceroy kind of thing that the reader has to kind of figure it out. Editors and referees should put that into the title. There should be open refereeing. PLS is doing that, and uh, F1000 is doing that. A lot of people are doing that. Funders. I maintain that you ought to fund the construction of the data set. I'm talking about mainly environmental epidemiology, where there's a lot of problems. The funder ought to fund the data construction and the analysis separately. The person who's doing the analysis should not have control over how the data set is built. They, they gain, they have the psychological thing. This is my data, even though we all paid for it. Then, I would be, this is harsh, I would not be funding exploratory studies. If I were a government agency, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of exploratory studies out there. We're, f we're awash in that. Consumers. We're scientists. We should call out bad studies. So it doesn't take more than half a day to write a letter to the editor and talk about multiple testing and lack of data access. Journalists, I think there's some in the room, Please read the base study before you write your article. Okay. Don't take the press release and rearrange the sentences. Okay. Read the actual paper. 
citizens? The clear answer here is don't believe a word of it. Okay? But you're paying for it. So write your congressman and tell him to stop paying and start getting good stuff. This has to be controlled by the managers of the system. We cannot talk to the scientists and have them fix things. Uh, $50 billion. More, please. Heart attacks with SO2, heart attacks with uh, NO2, I guess. It's it is. SO2. SO2, yeah. This is two, th two, two looks at SO2. Uh, we're sitting here in California. The tankers are streaming towards your ports. They're going to offload all their stuff. The people that are <coughs> deluded are telling them that you have to take the sulfur out of your fuel oil that you use in your tankers. The tanker people do not care. They're simply going to pass that cost on to the next person. $50 billion a year. That's what it's going to cost. Well, you ought to think a bit. I'm getting close to the end of time. Let's see where, oh. <laughs> I do bike rides and there's a swamp that I go by. So I take a picture of the swamp. We should all dedicate ourselves to help drain the science swamp. <laughs> Find a meta-analysis and do a p-value plot. Can be done in about a half a day. Uh, this is my contact information, and I'll I'll stop there. So thank you. I thank the National Association of Scholars and the Independent Institute for organizing this conference and for holding it here in Oakland. I especially appreciate the opportunity to speak about how reproducibility is essential to combating Lysenkoism in environmental epidemiology. I'm going to focus on the um, 2018 EPA transparency rule, formerly known as Strengthening Transparency in Regulatory Science. It can be summarized with this sentence, quote, the proposed regulation provides that when EPA develops regulations with regard to those scientific studies that are pivotal to the action being taken, EPA should ensure that the data underlying these are publicly available in a manner sufficient for independent validation. This is an essential element of the scientific method. Important links, including my comments to the Science Advisory Board, are shown in the links below, and they can be studied later. I'm going to show how current U.S. environmental epidemiology is related to Trofim Denisovich Lysenko. This Soviet agronomist destroyed agriculture in the Soviet Union and caused starvation by promoting false plant genetics and by suppressing honest scientists with the help of Joseph Stalin. Current U.S. Lysenkoism involves promoting air pollution death claims by misusing epidemiology, statistics, and toxicology, and by suppressing honest scientists with ad hominem smears, lack of funding, lack of citation, and career termination. I've experienced all of these tactics during the past 17 years. In fact, I consider it an act of God that I am able to still have any scientific credibility and that I am able to speak to you today. The specific example of environmental Lysenkoism that I want to focus on is fine particulate matter, PM 2.5. It's defined by size less than 2.5 microns in diameter. It comes mainly from combustion, forest fires, diesel engines, manufacturing. EPA established the 1997 Annual 
National Ambient Air Quality Standard, known as NACS, for PM2.5 has 15 micrograms per cubic meter. It was subsequently lowered to 12. It's based mainly on one 1995 American Cancer Society secret science epidemiology claim that PM2.5 causes premature deaths. The PM2.5 NACs has been used to justify many EPA regulations that have multi-billion dollar economic impacts in the United States. State implementation plans, air quality management plans, something here in California known as the CARB truck and bus regulation. Reasons for uh, no PM2.5 premature deaths exist. Good scientific reasons. There's no etiologic mechanism that inhaling one to five grams of invisible particles during a lifetime causes death. There are extremely weak epidemiologic relationships that don't satisfy the Hill criteria. There's an ideological fallacy that they're measuring air pollution exposure indirectly, not by exposure on individuals themselves. There are also uncontrolled confounding variables in the studies, such as other pollutants, temperature, and so forth. I did analysis, a reanalysis that reveals irreproducibility in the key study that I had just cited. And if you actually look at uh, data that's published on the totality of U.S. cohort studies, there's no relationship. Um, I'm going to focus on the key study. Oops, uh, this seems to be there. Let's see if I can keep this on track. Um, the um, 1982 American Cancer Society Cancer Prevention Study uh, has uh, falsely claimed PM 2.5 premature deaths. When the study was published in 1995, it used selected PM 2.5 data and um, secret data from the American Cancer Society. This was so contentious at the time and still is that the um, Health Effects Institution did a reanalysis. I'm going to discuss this further. It wasn't done properly. This uh, was continued in uh, 2009 when they did a, a follow-up report on ACS cohort and compounded the mistakes that they had done in uh, 2000. Uh, my um, reanalysis was published in March of 2017, and then I did a subsequent um, response to criticism in 2018. I was able to conduct and publish a reanalysis of the CPS2 data because one patriotic American followed the efforts to destroy my scientific credibility and read my 2007 Combating Lysenko article and reports of my legal battles with UCLA. In 2016, this person gave me a 30-year-old version of the CPS2 data the data that the American Cancer Society has refused to publicly release now for 25 years. Basically, the problem is uh, started with the, um, the reanalysis that was done by the Health Effects Institute in, starting in 1997 in response to the criticism. They were supposed to seek applications from teams composed of epidemiologists, statisticians, and air pollution exposure experts. And they were supposed to conduct sensitivity analyses to test the robustness of the 95 findings. Of the 13 teams that responded, uh, HEI uh, selected a 31-member Canadian team led by statisticians and a geographer and had only one epidemiologist who actually turned out not to be involved in the reanalysis. 
It's amazing that this kind of study couldn't have been done by American epidemiologists on an American study of epidemiology. So uh, in any case, the tip-off came um, on what was wrong if you look at the counties that were studied back in, uh, in the original publication. There were actually 11 counties in California that had PM 2.5 data around 1980, and uh, Pope and HEI only used four of those counties. Two of the counties they omitted actually had the highest, that's Riverside County, and the lowest, that's Santa Barbara County, PM 2.5 values in the entire nation at that time. Instead, they used um, uh, a, a city of Huntington in West Virginia, and that's in red in the lower right. Um, that study, that city, I can't even find in the EPA data that I was using, so I don't know where they got that number from. They used uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico as the low, and that value, I'm not sure where they got. But you can see there's different values of PM 2.5 in the three different columns, and IPN represents the inhalable particulate network. This is data published on the internet by EPA, easily usable. And uh, I, can't, I have no time to go through all of the, um, the details here, but the point is the results depend critically on the PM 2.5 values that are used. And this is an, uh, a sample of the analysis that I published. Um, if you use the IPN data from EPA and uh, use it for the, the 50 counties that were originally used in the 95 study, uh, and three of those values I can't find, so it actually reduces down to 47 counties, you see that um, the value that, that I get is 1.02, which is not statistically significant. Uh, the value using the uh, EPA and uh, Pope values comes out with 1.08, which is consistent with what was published uh, by Pope. Um, the uh, middle value is actually data that's in the reanalysis report that was never used by the reanalysis people, and um, it actually agrees with my findings. So they could have easily shown this uh, difference. Uh, if you break it into the Ohio Valley states and the other remaining states in the United States, you don't get a significant relationship with any of these PM 2.5 values. This was another tip-off that my reanalysis, that I was actually using genuine data from the American Cancer Society. This was a special analysis done in 2010 um, at the request of a group of California businessmen, um, all impacted by the PM 2.5 regulations. If you look at just the four counties in California, you actually wind up with an inverse relationship. The relationship is 0.9, roughly, in relative risk, and that agrees basically with what I found. Those are the numbers that are all shown. shown. So in summary, my reanalysis was done with strict confidentiality. This is an issue that keeps repeatedly being brought up, why you can't do uh, transparency, you can't release uh, underlying data. I've had this data now for four years. I haven't violated a single subject's confidentiality, and I never will. Um, I did it uh, quickly because I haven't done everything I could do. I wanted to get something published, and then I did it with no grant funding. Uh, these days, I'm so out of it that I couldn't get a grant from anybody. Um, and I also did it with no help from the American Cancer Society. Uh, there's and it continues to be strong resistance from the American Cancer Society, from the top, Gary Reedy, to the former uh, executive vice president for research, the current vice president for epidemiology, and former president, uh, uh, vice president for epidemiology. And they oppose the transparency rule for invalid reasons. There's a statement written they wrote in 2000. Uh, 13. Uh, they basically disown me, but they don't say I'm wrong. Uh, and they refuse any cooperation at all. And by the way, a lot of people don't realize they have two other cohorts they could analyze to, to basically replicate the uh, original findings. These are known as the uh, 1992 CPS2 nutrition cohort and the 2006 um, CPS3 cohort. 
much more recent than using data from 1982. Now I want to switch uh, briefly to the second major study that was used to justify the um, PM 2.5 NOx. This was the Harvard Six City study. There was a subpoena issued in 2013 by the House Science Committee for both the ACS and the Harvard Six City study data. Um, believe it or not, uh, the Harvard people actually did release a uh, somewhat defective um, version of this data, highly de-identified, and um, I was able to obtain it from the House Science Committee. Uh, it's also possessed by Harvard um, and presumably by EPA, although they've never, as far as I know, ever admitted they have it. Uh, and I put five uh, data points from this. Uh, they use something called the Anderson-Gill format, where it's done by um, person years. Each person year is a record. You couldn't possibly identify a human being from those numbers. You can see that the, this, these particular subjects are from the city of Topeka. Um, and then, if you look at their paper published in 2012, Le Poole paper, even in their own table two, they show no significant effect since 1991. See the numbers for starting 92 and 2001 are consistent with no effect. It's only if you integrate all the way back to um, 1974 that you get a, an effect. Of course, which numbers are you gonna choose? Um, now, this was done by a group of UCLA graduate students with expertise in uh, statistics, um, and they did it on my behalf, put together eight U.S. cohorts and find um, basically a um, no effect, 1.01 um, for the meta-analysis summary relative risk. This is, they also did this for six um, California cohorts including the one I published in 2005. Um, and uh, again, this is exactly 1.00. It's not even close. And it, it, either by the uh, fixed effects or the random effects meta-analysis, it comes out 1.0. Now, I was wondering, why, why is the EPA's policy assessment coming to different conclusions? Um, well, this involves this, uh, what I call gross falsification. Um, if you look at the author citations just by their last name, and I put on here the currently ongoing, I call it 2019 policy assessment, and also the 2011 policy assessment. If you look at the positive air pollution effects authors, and I totaled up 45, there's uh, 710 citations. For them, most of them based or connected in some way with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, including Pope, Samet, and Schwartz, three of the key principal players in this whole saga. Now there's an emerging group of Canadian investigators. Uh, suddenly we switch from the United States evidence to North American evidence. So somehow Canada jumps in to be part of the United States. And then there's ACS and California investigators. You look at the null uh, effects authors, like myself and this guy, um, we're at 10 citations, okay? And the same thing was true in 2011. If you look at the current CASAC members, there are even fewer citations, including none in uh, 2011. My complaint to the scientific integrity officer uh, accused this, um, their lead assessment person, Jason Sachs, of violating the sci EPA scientific integrity policy. I got back a response in September uh, which stated, falsification does not include the difference of opinion present. So in other words, uh, my conclusion is that uh, the EPA staff can write anything they want regarding PM 2.5 deaths without violating the EPA scientific integrity policy. I'll let you look at that policy and see if you agree with their uh, scientific integrity official. Um, this is the lead person, in my view, who's uh, worked on this issue for 30, more than 30 years. Um, 
Cleve Arden Pope III um, from BYU Economics. He's an agricultural economist. Um, he's basically ignored every attempt since 2008. This has been 12 years now I've tried to interact with him, and I list several of the interactions. He's even arrogant enough to defy the, uh, the House subpoena in 2013. And um, basically what he's done in order to avoid um, troublesome Enstrom is that now he's switched over to another cohort that's actually publicly available. It's the National Health Interview Survey. And um, I haven't had time to get this data, but the, uh, this is one where it's easy to try to, to replicate what, what's been done. And so he publishes three papers, 2018 and two, two in 2019, that are listed there. Uh, the last one being done by his uh, BYU undergraduate student, um, Jacob Leffler. And what he does is he doesn't cite Pope 1995. He doesn't so cite the HEI reanalysis, and he doesn't cite Enstrom. So, you know, I don't exist, and my reanalysis doesn't exist, and he doesn't feel any shame in just falsifying the research record. Uh, I have tried to reach his student, who's uh, up the road about 13 miles, in the, currently in the Berkeley uh, Agricultural Economics Department as a Ph.D. student. Uh, he's refused to respond to about six different requests I've made, including an invitation to this meeting, because I believe there's an error in his paper uh, where they come up with a positive relative risk of 1.1, whereas the uh, first person that published on this from... CDC, Parker, found an insignificant relationship of 1.02. So that's something that needs to be resolved. Now this becomes maybe the most fascinating part of my talk. This is a JAMA editorial called A Viewpoint that came out two weeks ago, January 23rd. Uh, during that week, there were some very important meetings going on at EPA, uh, and two people in this room were part of that meeting. This guy and the, the next speaker, Dr. Tony Cox. Um, so I believe the timing was deliberate. And this, again, uh, is about the uh, flaws of the transparency rule. And the, in this paper, they cite, they cite the HEI reanalysis as, you know, a way to deal with this. You don't have to give people like me underlying data. Just have HEI do the underlying data. But surprisingly, three years after I published it, they don't cite my reanalysis. So um, this is the kind of thing that goes on even at the top level. Okay, Feinberg had just published uh, a National Academy of Sciences report on reproducibility a few months ago. Now, he's currently the president of the Moore Foundation, uh, Gordon Moore Foundation, um, across the bay. And he hasn't revealed his conflicts of interest um, that would ties with the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of um, Public Health uh, going back into the 80s. He was a professor there, became dean in 1984, became provost of Harvard in 1997. He understand he negotiated the uh, HEA reanalysis involving the Harvard Six City study. He still has a current courtesy appointment. Um, and I wrote to him, and he actually responded, but basically, you know, yeah, so what? You know, you have your opinion, and I'm not going to bother with you, because I've tried now to reach, uh, see if what more we can do on getting this, this whole issue resolved. And it's not, it's not going so well. Now, um, I have some proposed actions that I believe that we can take. And we can take these right now, if there's some courageous people in the audience. Um, one is to promote, approve, and implement the EPA transparency rule. It's essential that there be access to underlying data. And this man agrees with me. We've been uh, fighting this as lonely battles for, for many years. 
Now it's not so lonely. We've got EPA on our side, which wasn't true uh, four years ago. Um, and so another is to reanalyze all the cohort studies. Uh, we've done this, um, but there's some other points here that are going to be difficult to um, accomplish in turning, uh, getting cooperation from the authors or getting peer review comments. But um, these at least can be requested. And my view is that um, the, uh, you do not approve the policy assessments of EPA until this, these things are done. They just should not be approved. Um, and that can be also requested. Final is to request funding from Feinberg and see if he will cooperate on this. He could easily fund this with the billions of dollars that the Moore Foundation has. So that's another test to see whether this can be done. So overall, I want to thank you again for uh, allowing me to speak and for um, hopefully uh, pushing forward on some of these action items. Thank you very much. For Stan, although it actually relates to both talks, his last slide said, that observational studies do not correct for multiple testing and multiple modeling. And you've done a lot of work in uh, developing techniques that, that do take account of those. But what do you say about the fact that some of the most vocal leaders of the uh, reform st statistical significance uh, methods are also saying don't adjust for multiple testing? which is tantamount to don't control for error probabilities. And insofar as that is true, do we really want to look to the managers, to some of the you know, uh, journal editors, who also have certain access to grind and uh, might actually thwart the goals that you have? We're in the middle of a mess. Um, <laughs> If you generalize from my analysis of the uh, meta-analysis studies, I have yet to see a meta-analysis study where the base studies that go in correct for multiple testing. There are 5,000 of these studies done each year. Half of those studies are done on observational studies. So there are 2,500 studies per year. Each of these studies links back to 10 to 20 other studies. The base studies are wrong. The meta-analysis study is wrong. I don't know the motive. There are some editors that really want to fix things up, but there are a lot of editors that this is a bridge too far. And if you think about it, um, there have been various estimates about how much stuff can't be reproduced. And you know, my simple counting and the, the p-value plots uh, indicate in a general way that probably half of the literature or 80 percent of the literature is without statistical support. That's the kind way to say it. Wrong is the other way to say it. Uh, that takes a lot of getting your head around things and trying to decide how you're going to do something about it. Now the NIH recently proposed that you don't get funding from the NIH unless you have a data sharing plan. And if you don't execute your data sharing plan, you never get another nickel from them. Well, that is teeth for management. Um, are, you, are you prepared to confront those managers or journal editors who say that we don't need to adjust for multiple tests? I said, yeah, they're simply wrong. I mean, I have <laughs> over and over again. I've written letters to the editor where I confront two issues. I confront multiple testing, multiple modeling, and I confront lack of access to data. And I've got, this is guerrilla warfare, uh, but I've done many of those things. And just think of the dichotomy. If you're doing a randomized clinical trial, you have to control all of this stuff. You have to control multiple testing. You have to control experimental technique. You have to control everything. Why do you get a pass if it's an observational study? You get to grab your data, and as Jim said, you get to massage your data. 
You get to publish your paper, and you don't give anybody else the data. That is insane. So the same journals that are ironclad on multiplicity control and everything on randomized clinical trials com do a complete about face on observational studies. It's insane. So I have confronted them, and I'm not getting very far. So uh, I, I think I'm the author of the, the most recent 2012 paper, extensive review uh, of the whole multiple comparison problem. And our conclusion in that paper was that there exists no objective methods for controlling for multiple comparisons. Um, and, and top statisticians going back many decades, especially ones from, from England, have also said pretty much the same thing. You can, you can posit, you can, you're going to do these particular things, but these particular things are very subjective, choosing uh, the way to do this. So this is a 2012 paper. I can send a copy to anybody who'd like to see it. But it's a, it's a very big issue um, because uh, there are where bureaucracies are involved, like FDA, for example, they get into a, a negative interaction between the bureaucrats and the statisticians. And that's what results in all these hyper convoluted methods that are yeah in okay vogue I, today. I, I've, we were on a stand between you and lunch I've, I've heard those sorts of criticisms uh, my first answer is the enemy of the good is the perfect there is no perfect way to correct for multiple testing there are very good ways of doing it and people throw that up because it's the enemy of the good is the perfect and they say well you're not perfect well, let's not do anything that's insane.